And let's welcome in our guest in this segment. He is the state Democratic Party chairman, Delegate Mike Pushkin. Mike, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on again. Great to have you with us. This is the first time we've had a chance to speak with you since the legislative session ended, the 60-day, and there's also been an interim uh, since then. And I still have not uh, had the opportunity to ask you your take on the last session, Mike, in regards to legislation that was both passed and not passed and the priorities of the Democratic Party in those 60 days. I, I, I didn't realize it had been that long since I've been on. Yeah. But, uh, it's good to be back on. And I, was, I could sum up the, uh, the legislative session really in uh, two words, uh, to be honest. That would be misplaced priorities. Um, while they uh, you know, managed to pass a uh, legislative pay raise, a uh, pay raise for themselves, which I did not support. They passed a legislative pay raise, but the same week that they uh, also raised uh, premiums uh, on PEIA, raised uh, health care uh, for state workers. Um, and what they failed to do was address some of the crises that we have in state government. I mean, namely, we'll, you know, we've been under a state of emergency for our jails and prisons um, for uh, getting close to a year now. We have the um, National Guard staffing our, our prisons. That, that's not sustainable. It's not safe uh, for the inmates. It's not safe for the correctional officers. And um, they did not, it hasn't been addressed. And now the governor is saying that he will not call us in for a special session, um, you know, until the legislature works it out without him, I guess. Uh, so I you know, said misplaced priorities, uh, a good uh, description of the session. What would you have preferred that they do in regards to a priority issue, Mike? And I know you mentioned some of the negatives about passing the, uh, the increase in health care insurance uh, for PEIA members. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the, when you're under a state of emergency for uh, for our jails and prisons, that should have been a priority. That's something. If it's a state of emergency, that that means it demands it to, you know, to be addressed immediately, and it was not addressed. There was a bill that was moving that was a significant pay raise uh, for correctional officers uh, that didn't pass. Um, I don't know if it's just a pay raise or if what we really need to address uh, is just the entire. Uh, pay scale for correctional officers. If we keep it, you know, all towards the the front end of the career, if it's just you know year one through three where all the pay raises are, and then the job becomes very stagnant after that, which is the case. So we're losing the veterans in in, uh, in the correctional field. We're losing the people who've been there a while because they don't feel that they're being rewarded. They're not paid based on their rank. They're not paid based on how long they've been there. Most of the raises come in the first three years. Uh, that's the issue. You, you find that kind of stuff out by talking to people who work in the field, uh, really by answering your phone at the Capitol, and that's how you, how you learn about these things. It was not addressed, um, but we have shortages all over state government. We have shortages in in um, you know, child protective services. We have we don't have a shortage of children in foster care. We have over seven thousand children in foster care. We have a teacher shortage. Uh, we weren't able to address that. We haven't been able to address something that affects uh, uh, up in your part of the state with uh, location pay, being able to retain and attract teachers and, and other people in the public sector and not lose them to either Maryland or Virginia. Uh, we haven't been able to address that. Um, we have what I would call a real people problem in West Virginia. We're one of two states that seems to just be just hemorrhaging population. And that affects the public sector. That affects the private sector. Often here we don't have people to work. We have some of the uh, lowest workforce participation rates in the entire country. And um, the legislature didn't just – it's not that they just didn't address it. They they exacerbated the problem. They made it worse uh, by making you know, the public sector works – work sorry, public sector jobs uh, less attractive by, by hiking up the uh, premiums on PEIA and then – you know, there's a radio show on at the same time down here in Charleston, um, and uh, the, the my counterpart in the Republican Party, the chair of the West Virginia Republican Party, went on that show right after the session and said the quiet part out loud. Um, she said, uh, when asked why there was a succession in the Republican Party of focusing on uh, culture war issues, focusing on divisive issues that the legislature seemed to be focused on this year. Uh, she said, well, if you don't agree with it, you know, if you don't ag- agree with our stance on these issues, maybe you should live somewhere else. Maybe you should go to San Francisco. Maybe you should go to New York. That's the exact opposite uh, uh, 
what we should be saying. Uh, any any public official, anybody with a statewide platform like she has, exact opposite of what we should, we should be saying. We should be doing what we can to attract people here because a lot of our problems really stem from population loss. You know, that's a, a great point. And uh, I have to say, I, I see this when it comes to people who just moved to West Virginia running for office. And Governor of Justice did it recently with Alex Mooney. Alex moved to West Virginia in 2012 or 13, ran for Congress, and has been serving since 14. And one of the things Justice said was, well, he's from Maryland. And what I don't think you can have it both ways. You can't encourage people to move to the state and then criticize them when they moved here 10 years ago and run for office. You know, we call those people carpetbaggers derisively. Right. So if you want to attract people to the state, we should attract them to the state and say there's, there's a caveat. If you move here, don't you run for office because because you're not a real West Virginian. You moved here. You're paying well, taxes, but you're not real. So that's an interesting uh, uh, example. I think we need we also need people to move here to be correctional officers, to be police officers, to be firefighters, first responders, to be teachers, to work in 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 uh, uh, child protective services, also to work in the private sector. Um, I don't think we have a real shortage of Republicans running for office right now. No, so, no, we don't. Uh, no. But, yeah, and, and if somebody was you – know, and, and, but I, I think all kinds are welcome here. We want people to move here, whether they're coming here to uh, uh, buy a seat in Congress or whether they're coming here to actually help out with some of the real issues we have. Just couldn't resist that, could you, Mike? Couldn't resist that. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mike. Uh, a few minutes ago, you went through a whole litany of things that uh, had not been addressed by the previous session. Uh, but one that you did not mention and is getting the quite uh, a lot of um, – attention up here is that of school security uh we had senator charlie crump on earlier today and the question was asked was uh was school security addressed and uh and senator crump said it was uh but yet we did not hear very much at least in the eastern panhandle of meaningful action that would take that was taken to address school security well, I, I don't feel that we really had meaningful action to address school, school security. And when you're seeing about all these hor horrific uh, you know, uh, uh, tragedies that are occurring like on a monthly basis, some are more often than that around the country, I just feel that West Virginia has been tremendously lucky that it hasn't happened here. But I don't think it's because of anything that the legislature or the governor has actually done, because I can't think of anything that they really have done. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, we, we put money into the to the school building, you know, school building authority and try to secure the uh, the buildings. I'm sure that's done all over the country. Um, I can't think of anything that was really done to address the issue here. Yeah. You left Bill speechless there. I haven't well, seen no, that no, no. I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, let me phrase it. What should we I be doing? I think we've just been very lucky. Yeah. I mean, I've what? met with, with the folks over at the Fusion Center here, here in Charleston, and, and they are – you know, tasked with, you know, keeping the public safe from whether it's uh, uh, from terrorist threats or other or other threats. And um, I, I just feel that really, I mean, the reason that nothing that we haven't seen any of these horrible events happening here, it's just to me, I can't think of anything other than just being lucky and I hope we continue that luck. Yeah. Points well taken. Really what what should you as legislators be doing to address this issue? What can be done? Well, I think one thing would be to uh, really address access to mental health. Uh, we haven't uh, done enough to that. We have a mental health crisis in the country, especially here in West Virginia. I hear it all the time uh, from constituents that they have friends or loved ones that are, aren't able to get the help they need here. Uh, that would be one way to address it. We really need to look into the, the root causes of it. Um, and then, of course, you know, building security. Um, I know one thing that is definitely off the table here in West Virginia that they're not going to talk about is any kind of uh, um, whether it's a red flag laws or any other thing and looking at who's able to obtain uh, you know, some of these uh, high powered weapons. But I don't, that's not going to happen uh, with the current makeup of this legislature and the, and the state government we have now in West Virginia. John Gilstrap, as the resident carpetbagger, uh, <laughs> recently moved hey, to, this, to, to this wonderful to this wonderful state. Uh, 
there's been kind of a sea change politically over the last few years uh, in the, a swing from West Virginia being a, a Democrat state to a Republican state. Do you think that the the national Democratic Party narrative, the AOC narrative, the um, sort of what I would what I would call the extreme left, is that harmful to the local Democratic Party? Does is does that drive the, di- the diminishing numbers of Democratic legislatures legislators uh, in in Charleston? I think that the narrative itself is harmful, but I don't believe that the narrative is the reality uh, when it when it comes down to it. Um, you know, of course, you know, if, if depending on uh, which news silo people decide to get their information from, they will hear stories about the extreme on either side. When the the reality is, most people are somewhere in the middle, and, and most people don't walk around you know thinking about it all the time. Um, but I will say that one of the, I mean, you have to look at the uh, the maps that were drawn. Uh, uh, in, in, in 2021, and that did play a huge factor in it. Now, I'm not saying that we're, uh, you know, any, of course, you know, we've become more of a red state, but if you look at the makeup of the House of Delegates, we have 100 members. Um, we now have 11, well, after the appointment in Mon County, we will have 11 Democrats. We make up more than 11% of the state, so the maps have been gerrymandered. Uh, I would say we're closer to a third. If the maps were fair, we'd have we would have more members, and I, I think it's the same can be said in the rest of the country. It's been it's been gerrymandering through every red state in the country, and some of the blue states, like the, uh, in Maryland, they do the same thing over there on the other side. It's wrong no matter who does it. It's not democratic, and it causes a really misrepresentation in government. And you have <laughs> vast majority of congressional seats aren't competitive in the fall. They're only competitive in the primaries, and that's how you get the – that's how you wind up with an AOC or a Marjorie Taylor Greene or the extremists on either side. When the when the election is occurring, the real the race is occurring in the primary and, and not in the general, and that's because of the way the maps are drawn. Well, I saw an interesting statistic this morning. You know that um, the Democrats have won all but one popular vote in a presidential election, all but one popular vote. Uh, since 1992, but totally misrepresented in Congress. That's due to to, uh, to, uh, to gerrymandering. Well, Mike, gerrymandering's been around, been very active for several, several years. Uh, and you're right, it's done on both sides. But back, looking back as recently as 20 years or so ago uh, in Berkeley County, Eastern Panhandle, where it was a Democratic controlled uh, uh, government, there was always, at election, there was always a viable Republican candidate on the ballot. You look today, there are no, excuse me, a lot of the offices do not have any Democratic candidate on the, on the ballot. You cannot put that at the foot of gerrymandering. You have to put that at the foot of the, the party not encouraging good candidates to get out and run. Well, that's going to change. I've been, uh, and I've been chair of the party for less than a year. Um, we received the maps uh, around late October and close to Halloween. The, the filing period was in January. We had a very short turnaround time to go out and, and recruit candidates. Uh, and, of course, it is harder to get uh, people to run when they know they're going to serve in the, in the minority as opposed to uh, uh, serving in a majority, especially the further away you get from the Capitol, and, and y'all are pretty far away from the Capitol. But uh, that will change, and, and one of our goals is to make sure people have choices up and down the ballot. But, you know, we still uh, hold um, a lot of offices on the municipal level uh, throughout the state. And I know some of the, you know, a lot of these places, they're nonpartisan, uh, but we still have a lot of registered Democrats that are doing the work for the people on the municipal level. And that's very important. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we're actually dealing with the day-to-day problems of the average citizen. Mike. So, but we we you're right though we need to, we need to do a better job of uh, of recruiting good candidates up and down the ballot, and we're that's what we're doing now. Mike Pushkin is of the... course you know you hear every day you hear about a different Republican uh, that's going to throw their hat in the ring for governor or for, or for Senate or for all these uh, the top of the ballot, <laughs> but it's early. 
I would remind your listeners that it's it's not Memorial Day yet. Uh, typically, it's closer to Labor Day when you get more announcements, more announcements of people running for office. I think what the Republicans are lining up for, they're uh, jockeying for position of what's going to um, turn out to be some pretty messy primaries, uh, especially in the gubernatorial race and in the uh, in the race for U.S. Senate. Delegate Mike Pushkin is the West Virginia State Democratic Party chairman. You mentioned the numbers are 89 to 11. David Elliott Pritt defected to the Republican Party recently, Mike, and you are actually with 10 sitting members because uh, Daniel Walker's seat still has to be replaced. Did Pritt talk to you before he switched? No, he did not. And I, I talked to um, I talked to Elliot. Uh, he goes by Elliot. I talked right. to Elliot a lot. Uh, leading up to that, but he did not tell me that he was going to, he didn't tell any of the members of the caucus that he was going to switch before he did. He was talking to some of the Republican members. But um, knowing what I know now, um, it shouldn't come as any shock to anyone that uh, Elliot Pritt switched parties because it's not the first time he switched parties. Um, He's 33 years old. He has, what we found, he has switched parties 10 times at least in his 33 years. Uh, he started off as a Republican. Uh, he switched to uh, no party, went back to Republican, um, went back, switched to no party not long after Trump was elected. I guess he got off the Trump train, was not a fan of, of President Trump. And then, um, strange thing is, he was actually a registered socialist. <laughs> now, that word gets thrown <laughs> that word gets thrown around a lot by Republicans. They yeah. Wrong, 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 wrongly called uh, labeled Democrats as socialists. Well, Elliot Pritt actually was a registered socialist, and that's not a. Uh, they don't have ballot access in West Virginia, so he actually had to handwrite it on the nice. um, voter registration application that he, he wrote in in all caps, socialist. And then when he decided to run for House of Delegates the first time, he probably figured it'd be difficult to get elected as a socialist, so he changed to Mountain Party. Uh, which uh, didn't work out for him. He came in dead last when he ran Mountain Party, and then he switched uh, back to no party again, then to Democrat, and was successful, won in this last election, and now he's a Republican. So when Republicans start throwing around the uh, the socialist word, uh, the only actual uh, former registered socialist is now in their caucus. (laughs) That's that's beautiful. (laughs) You know, you got to have somebody in there who's got a statue of Eugene Debs on his uh, mantle. Um, And and actually, it's 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 funny you should say that because there's an old, uh, I think, an old um, uh, post or uh, 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 an interview that we we did found where uh, he claims that his. uh, political hero was Eugene Debs. Oh, well, that's beautiful. Uh, in regards to the replacement of Daniel Walker, how will that work, and when do you expect someone to be seated? Well, uh, I mean, it's pretty much laid out in statute how it works. The uh, the uh, uh, Montegalia County Democratic Executive Committee, which is a, a mouthful to say, they have been meeting regularly since Daniel's uh, uh, resignation. And they had they put out a public notice, and they've been getting applications, and they had uh, plenty of very qualified Democrats step up who um, who were looking for that appointment, and they've been conducting interviews uh, for the past week and a half or so. Uh, those will wrap up today, and then the committee will meet this evening and narrow it down to three names, and those three names will be submitted to the governor tomorrow, and then the gov that would give the governor and his office five days. Uh, to select out of those three. So everything's going um, smoothly as scheduled. Uh, uh, we should know the three names tomorrow. How how thrilled are you that there is a former socialist now in the Republican Party in the legislature? <laughs> <laughs> what does well, that do for your you day? I, I, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you really can. But, uh, uh-huh. yeah, so when they start throwing that word around, we yeah. can just – Point right, right back at them, and say, "Well, you know, he's sitting on your side." They'll say he learned the evil of his ways. <laughs> uh, Mike, your reaction to the expected announcement Thursday that the governor will run for U.S. Senate? Well, <laughs> so that's coming Thursday. Is that what we're, we've been told? Yes. Well, I, I know there was an announcement from the governor's one of the governor's businesses that came out. I don't know if you're aware of this. He put out a press release. His, his family put out a press release at 11 p.m. Friday evening. Did you get that? No. In regards to this uh, the debt settlement 
uh, with, uh, I believe, the Carter Bank in Virginia, Mm -hmm. where they, once again, one of his businesses doesn't want to pay its debts. Um, but generally, when somebody when a press release goes out at 11 p.m. on a Friday, it's bad news. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's something that they, that they don't want people to know. Um, but they had to say they put out the press release. So I, I imagine the announcement on Thursday won't be at 11 p.m. at <laughs> no. night, um, no, no <laughs> like this announcement was. Yeah. I would say this: uh, it, you know, to be uh, in the U.S. Senate, you got to show up. In fact, to be successful at anything. You have to show up. I believe it was said, you know, 80% of success is showing up. Um, the governor doesn't show up. I've, I've served in the legislature during his entire uh, tenure as governor, and we rarely see him uh, during session. Um, he's generally, you know, coaching basketball during that time of year, and it shows. And we, you know, I talked earlier about the problems with corrections. We have the National Guard staffing our, our prisons right now. We are in, in crisis mode in corrections. We have uh, problems with the DHHR. <laughs> the um, his handpicked secretary, the DHHR, had to resign right before session because it's just a uh, total uh, toxic culture over at the DHHR. We've had problems now with the state police, but uh, his uh, handpicked uh, his superintendent of the state police had to recently step down you know, amid scandal, and it all stems from the top. You know, when the boss doesn't show up for work. Uh, things don't don't run so smoothly. So um, if he chooses to announce, um, I, I I think that uh, he'll be a really bad choice for senator because he won't show up. What do you anticipate Senator Manchin will be doing, Mike? Um, well, you know, he has stated publicly that he hasn't made his mind up yet, and that he doesn't he's not in a hurry to make that announcement. And uh, I said, you know, on our side, we're I mean, you'll be hearing more announcements from the Democratic side as we get closer to Labor Day. Um, but uh, I believe Senator Manchin, when he says he's not, he hasn't made his mind up what he's going to do. But I, I do believe that if he chooses to run for re-election to the U.S. Senate, that he will win uh, because of the job that he has done. And uh, people know uh, Senator Manchin here. They're we're, uh, you know, reaping a lot of the benefits from some of the work that he's done over the past few years. When you hear about these uh, announcements of uh, of new investments in West Virginia, whether it's <laughs> excuse me, whether it's Nucor or um, you know Form Energy that's going in in the Northern Panhandle, or uh, you know a company that's building electric school buses down here where I live, uh, that has way more to do with the Inflation Reduction Act than it has anything to do with what Governor Justice has done. Mike, always so a pleasure. Believe, to... If he announces he's running, I believe he will win. Always a pleasure to speak with you, sir. Um, by the way, uh, Delegate Mike Height is hanging out in our comment section today, and uh, he said he's given you his endorsement. He says you're a good guy. Well, he's a good guy, too. Yeah. I'm we'll, not going to go we'll as go. far as to endorse him yet, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but, but, That's not like going crazy. Guy. I just got to know him. He's a new delegate. Got to know him. Mm-hmm. And I have plenty of friends on the other side of the aisle, as, as they do, too. And so, you know, we've got to all work together. And I, I really I like people who are able to leave the uh, – you know, the ideology and the uh, party labels at the door and just come down and get to work. So I, I like him. He's a good guy. Good to talk with you, sir. Have a great day. Hey, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having Mike. me on. Delegate Mike Pushkin. Pushkin, he is the uh, West Virginia State Democratic Party chair as well.